All right, First Peter, uh, where we are. In chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, he tells the persecuted Gentile Christians in Asia Minor, he tells them to live such good lives among the unbelievers that the unbelievers may be led to Christ by observing their good work so that they might join in the chorus praising God when he returns or when he visits on that day, when Christ returns to finalize history. And this good living that he urges them to engage in so as to draw people, this includes submitting to various authorities. So he then goes and and tells them in chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, he commands all of them to submit to various governing authorities. In 2, 18 to 25, he commands slaves to submit to their earthly masters, even those who mistreat them. And in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, he commands wives to submit to their husbands. All of this here, you see, it has an effect on the world as they see our good lives that we might draw them into the kingdom. Then Peter, after that, he mentions the corresponding duty in chapter 3, verse 7, of husbands to their wives. Whereas wives are to submit to their husbands, husbands are called to live with their wives in accordance with their knowledge of God's will, which is that they pay honor to their wives. Now, Paul says some other things about husband's duty, but let's not slide over this responsibility to pay honor to your wife. And as I said, you know, that the caricature of Christian husbands in our society is they're either perverts, you know, or they're just brutal to the children and to the wife and that kind of thing. It's how they're always portrayed. And it ought to be that Christian husbands, that Christian wives should be saying, You don't want any husband other than the Christian husband. Okay, so Christian husbands are to honor their wives. And this is so important that he says that failing to do so will disturb the husband's relationship with God so that it will hinder his prayers. See, a a husband cannot mistreat his wife and then come to God as though everything's hunky-dory. He's over here treating his wife, dishonoring his wife, not treating her the way God calls him to treat her. And then like, no big deal. No, see, God will discipline him in that his prayers will be hindered. So that's what he's talking about there. Now, let's pick back up in chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. He says, finally, all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, loving as brothers, compassionate and humble, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, blessing. For to this you were called in order that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever wants to love life and to see good days, let him stop the tongue from evil and his lips are not to speak deceit and let him turn from evil and let him do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, living differently from Yet attractively to the hostile world, it involves not only submitting to various authorities, but also living with one another in love and harmony and not repaying mistreatment by the world. So it's not just about submitting to authorities. There's another aspect of this living differently from yet attractively to the world that he mentioned in 2.11 and 12. And that is, is that we live with one another in love and harmony and we not repay this mistreatment as the world mistreats us. We not then act in kind in their relationships with one another. He says they're to be like minded. And this shouldn't come as a surprise in that as disciples, we are all to share the perspective of Christ. Right. I mean, we're to look at We're to look at things from his perspective. We have joined the revolution. We have said, I understand that Jesus Christ is Lord. I understand what God has revealed. And we've committed ourselves to that. So we all stand here and look at things from a a similar perspective. So he's saying, look, you're to all be like minded. He urges them to be that way because we share this perspective in Christ. And we're also to be what sympathetic toward one another. You think about the thing, how this would change congregational life if we got hold of these things in a radical way. He says you're to be sympathetic toward one another, you know, not with this, you know, growling face that sits here and looks and says, you know, uh, anytime I have no sympathy for you at all. Yeah. Sympathetic toward one another is how we are to be sympathetic toward one another. We are to love one another. 
We are to be compassionate toward one another and we're to be humble toward one another. Well, you can just see, I hope, that if this was something that when people walked into the congregation, they said, look, they are sympathetic toward one another, compassionate toward one another. They love one another. They're humble toward one another. I hope you'd see how that would change things. If people go, wow, what a group of people. How otherworldly is this? I've never seen a community of people like this. What's going on? You see how that that would draw people because it's otherworldly. And so this is what he's urging them to do, not simply submitting to various authorities, but he tells them to do this in their relationships with one another and in their relationships with the world and with one another if need be. But I think he's focusing here on the relationships with the world. They're not to respond to mistreatment in kind. As the world turns and mistreats us, we are not to react and respond to that mistreatment in kind. Instead of returning evil for evil or insult for insult, We are to respond by blessing the perpetrators. Ooh, that's what I tell you. See, when you talk about Christianity, the caricature of Christianity is this idea that it's just, you know, it's this weak cellophane thing that doesn't really get down into somebody's life and transform. You talk about transforming. Here you have something where people are are mistreating you, and he says that you are to bless the perpetrators, you're to bless them, see, by asking God to show his favor and grace upon them. Now, is that strength? As somebody mistreats you, that you are able then to say, God, bless them? And you have now, that's that strength. You see? But that's not how Christianity is portrayed. It's just like I said, it's oftentimes portrayed as something uh, much shallower than that. But he says, look, in their relationships with the world, you don't repay mistreatment. With with mistreatment, you don't repay it in kind. And I think the focus has shifted here, even though he's talking first about, you know, brothers compassionate. When he gets to verse nine, I think the focus has shifted to unbelievers. As you find that similar teaching elsewhere, it refers to relations of Christians to those who attack them. So I think he's shifted now and he's talking there about responding to the outside world. Not only do you see that elsewhere, but also here in first Peter, how Christian responds Christians respond to unbelievers who mistreat them. It's an important theme in 1 Peter. So I think he's made that switch there. In fact, in 1 Peter 2, verse 23, when the Lord was insulted by opponents, he didn't return insults. So see, that, that resonates here. He says, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, blessing. This is part of how you're to be so different from the world, so that as people are mistreating you, You're not striking back and treating them that way and say, you know, like Donald Trump, when somebody messes with me, that's not the word he uses, but when somebody messes with me, I mess back in spades. That's the world's philosophy. You see, you mess with me and you're going to wish you hadn't because I'm going to double it and I'm going to just, you know. No, it's it's to, to bless them, to pray for God's mercy and benefit in their lives, to pray for their well-being, loving your enemies. See, Paul, he commands the same thing, right? Romans 12, 17, do not repay anyone. Evil for evil, 1 Thessalonians 5.15, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. 1 Corinthians 4.12, when we're cursed, what do we do? We bless. See, so this isn't, this isn't something aberrational. This is common New Testament teaching. That this is how we're to react. And you see it will get the world's attention because the world doesn't act this way. And this teaching is, of course, it's rooted in Jesus' teaching. That's where this comes from. It comes from the Lord himself. For example, in Luke 6, 27 and 28, he says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Now, this is tough. You see, this is tough, but this is what we are called to as Christians. We are called to be that different. And we said, yes, we said, I'm in for it. I'm in for the whole thing. Transform me, Lord. I want to be like you. Make me over. And so God works on us. And you see how deep it goes. This is how we are to be. Karen Jobes, in her commentary, she says it's imperative here to understand what loving one's enemies means in contrast to modern ideas of love. Such modern ideas led one student to ask in exasperation, how can Jesus expect me to love my enemies when I don't even like them? See, loving in modern culture refers primarily to an emotional attachment of a greater intensity than merely liking. 
But Peter clearly interprets Jesus' command to love to refer not to emotions, but to acting rightly toward one's adversaries, regardless of whatever emotions may or may not be involved. Jesus' teaching on loving one's neighbor is presented in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, 25, 37. See that. Acting rightly towards one's adversaries is defined in 1 Peter 3, 9 as not responding in kind to their insults, slander, and evil intents. It means having the inner fortitude to break the cycle of evil that spirals ever downward. This is what he's talking about. So if somebody mistreats you, what do you, you seek their welfare. Instead of, I want, I want the worst thing to happen to you. You mess with me, I want you to get run over by a truck. I want your family, something to happen to them. And I'll, no. See, that's a worldly kind of perspective. The Christian is mistreated. How is he to be? And this is the target. This is the goal. How is he to be? The Christian is to be somebody who seeks the benefit and welfare and blessing of the person who's after them. Now, that's high calling. You see, that's high calling and that's big stuff. But that's what we've been called to. Okay, back here in this section. Peter says, in essence, in essence, in the second part of verse nine, that they were called by God to a faith. That is inextricably tied to a way of life, a way of life that includes loving their enemies and not retaliating against them. You see, he says here in in nine, he says, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, blessing for because to this you were called in order that you may inherit a blessing. Hey, they're called this way. They're called to this faith that is inextricably tied to a way of life. They were called to this faith slash life, faith slash way of life, in order that they may inherit the blessing of eschatological salvation, end time salvation, entrance into the consummated kingdom of God. They are called to live this way that they might inherit those blessings. See, that verb inherit, it recalls the eternal inheritance that he mentioned in chapter one, verse four which is the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, meaning the time of the final judgment at Christ's return. You see, we are to have this faith slash life. We are to be genuine. We are to be true believers that we might inherit this blessing. Here's what J. Ramsey Michael says in his commentary. He says the context of chapter one, verse four, reinterpreted the inheritance understood in the Old Testament as the promised land. To refer to an eternal and heavenly salvation to be revealed at the coming of Christ. The same reinterpretation is assumed both here and in chapter 3, verse 7. The grace of life is an eternal future life. And eulogia, or blessing, is God's final pronouncement that is bestowal of eternal well-being on his people at the last day. So he's tying these things. That this faith life that you may inherit the blessing. That you may be this way. Now, Peter supports he supports his linking of their way of life to salvation. He does this by reference to a psalm. I didn't I quoted it, but I didn't indent it like most of the translations do. But he supports this this linking of their way of life to salvation by this psalm, because he says in verse 10, first and nine, he says, on the contrary, for to this you were called in order that you may inherit a blessing for because. And then he quotes this psalm or appeals to this psalm. Uh, in support of that, and it's Psalm 34, verses 12 to 16. And here's what Schreiner says about it. He says, in, in the historical context of the psalm, life zoane and good days, hemeris agathos, refer to life and blessing in this world. But for Peter, this language almost certainly referred to the eschaton, to end time salvation. We've already seen in chapter 1, verse 4, that the inheritance refers to eschatological salvation. The language of the psalm, therefore, is understood typologically in that the promise of life and good days in the land points toward and anticipates life in the world to come. Similarly, the language in chapter three, verse seven also demonstrates that Peter thought of the coming reward since joint heirs of the grace of life signifies life in the future age. See, the psalm indicates that the blessings of God are for those who live godly lives. That's what he quotes. Now, this disturbs us. We don't like this idea of any kind of linking of salvation to living. And but but what he's talking about, the unstated reason for doing that is that genuine faith necessarily and inevitably expresses itself in godly living. You cannot break the two. 
You see, I've said this ad nauseum. Biblical faith is not mere intellectual assent to certain truths. It is not simply, I think that's true. It is a surrender to those truths. It is the yes of the total person. That's what biblical faith is. That's why biblical faith inevitably finds expression in a person's life. If a person says, I believe this is true and lives like it's not true, then according to the Bible, he doesn't believe it's true. Well, you know, we understand this and everything else. I don't know why this is so difficult here. It's just two different ends of the same stick. Living is a reflection of biblical faith. And so that's how he ties them together. Not only they're all through the Bible. You see these references to works and all these things in judgment, looking at works and life because the two life flows from faith. And that's what he's talking about. That's what he appeals to. He looks to that psalm and he says, listen, this is the nature of faith. He doesn't spell that out, but that's why he ties the two together. That's why he ties godly living To eschatological salvation. It is because it necessarily and inevitably flows out of biblical faith. Genuine submission to Christ, which is not simply thinking something is true. The demons think something is true. They don't submit to it. And again, as I've said many times, coming to a conviction of the truth simply puts you in the valley of decision. I don't know about your journey to Christian faith, but that was true for me. I feel I didn't believe any of this. I was at least a practical atheist, if not a philosophical one, because I didn't care a thing about any of this stuff. And yet when I looked into these things and I came to this conviction that this is truth, well, now the question is, what do you do with it? When I didn't believe it was true, I didn't have to decide what will I do with it. It's when I came to the conviction it was true. Now the question is, will you follow Will you follow? See, that's what puts you in the valley of decision. I now know this Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Will I follow Him? Will I become a disciple? Will I commit my life to Him? Will I live for Him? There are people who think that's true and say, I'm not going to do that. I like living for myself. I like being on the throne of my life. I like doing these things. I want to run my life, so it's not... They understand it, but they say, listen, sin is too attractive. They wouldn't put it that way. They would always mask it with some kind of junk. But the bottom line would be, this is too big a price to pay. And I remember Brother John. John uh, was the one who taught me about Jesus. That's only a small part of why I love him so much. But he taught me about Jesus Christ. And I remember one, one time we were sitting here and I told him, he was dogging me just hard because we've always been close and he just wouldn't, wouldn't quit on me. And he, I, I thought that he, I, that he probably the only person that could have done this. But uh, I remember telling him one time, I said, listen, you can do what you want to. Because he told me he believed us. I think it was right when you're getting ready to get baptized. But I said, but I'm never going to quit drinking. I thought, you know, how in the world are you going to quit drinking? What do you do with your time? <laughs> you know, what in the world? I mean, that seemed crazy. You know, see, so that's the idea. All right, we, then you have to get in the valley of decision. All right, that's a long uh, little side road there, but I think it's important. So here's what Schreiner says about this comment. He says, Peter was hardly suggesting that believers will live perfectly and that such perfection is necessary to obtain an inheritance. But he was insisting that a transformed life is necessary to obtain the inheritance. You and I are all bent and twisted in different ways. The things that are difficult for me may not be difficult for you and vice versa. Okay, we are all mangled human beings. And as we come to Christ, we give him our life and then we limp toward his image. Okay, we are trying to be like him. What he calls us to, we fall, get up, fall, get up. But we keep our eyes on him and we do that in perfect peace and security because we are pursuing the master. It is not that we are going to achieve perfection, kick in heaven's door and say, you're very fortunate to have me because of my moral excellence. That's not happening. But we are in faith, sincerely pursuing his likeness because he's called us to do that. Do you see the difference in that? The child who's walking toward his father, down, up, down, up, down, up, walking toward him, walking toward him, walking toward him. And God's just going, Come on, just keep going. Come on, just keep coming. You see the difference in that and the person who says, I'm through with you. I don't care. We recognize that in kids. That's the idea. 
See, so there's, this flows out of biblical faith, but it is not a matter of perfection. It is not a matter of achievement and earning your standing before God. It is a matter of being serious and genuine. And when you said, Jesus is Lord, you meant it. And you live a life that reflects that. That's what he's talking about. Okay. Now, we're going to have a long section here. This is a long section. We won't get through it at all, but... Uh, three slides. I want to do this. This is a section I look at him talking about encouragement to righteous living in the face of opposition. And there's some tough sledding in here. OK, and we'll work through it. I don't know how far we can get, uh, but we're going to have to pick up in a couple of weeks, I'm sure. But here I'm going to read the whole thing and we'll come back and look at it in sections. Chapter three, verse 13, 13 through chapter four, verse six. He says, now, who is the one that will harm you if you are zealots of the good? Indeed, even if you should suffer because of righteousness, you are blessed. So do not fear the fear of them, or usually translated what they fear. Do not fear their fear. I mean, so do not fear their fear, or the fear of them is a more woodenly literal thing. So do not fear the fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your heart, sanctify the Christ as Lord, being always ready to give a defense to anyone who demands an accounting for the hope in you. But do so with gentleness and fear, having a clear conscience in order that when you are spoken against, those reviling your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if the will of God wills than for doing evil. Because Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison when they formerly disobeyed, when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. This water also, as an antitype, that is, baptism, now saves you, not through, not a removal of dirt from the flesh, but a pledge of a good conscience toward God, Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who having gone into heaven, is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers being subject to him. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, you also must arm yourselves with the same resolve. For he who suffered in the flesh has finished with sin. So as to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For enough time has passed to have participated in the desires of the Gentiles, having traveled in licentiousness, lust, instances of drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and detestable acts of idolatry, regarding which they are surprised by your not running with them into the same flood of debauchery, vilifying you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For to this end, the gospel also was preached to the dead that they may be judged in the flesh according to men, but live by the Spirit according to God. I hope you can see there's a lot of stuff in here. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in here, and we're going to do our best to chop through it. Now, given the blessing in store for those who live faithfully, which he just talked about in chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, given that blessing that's in store, he asked rhetorically, who will harm one who is devoted to God's will, devoted to doing Good in God's eyes. And the anticipator, the assumed answer is that no one will. Okay, when he says, now, who is the one that will harm you if you are zealots for the good? If you are committed to doing what is good in God's eyes, who's going to touch you? Who's going to mess with you? Who's going to harm you? And the assumed answer is no one. And by that, Peter doesn't mean that faithful Christians won't suffer harm and persecution or that they'll only suffer persecution rarely He means that the eternal blessing that is in store for them from God, what they have in store from God, that in light of that, that makes any harm they suffer in persecution in this life so relatively insignificant as to not count as harm in any meaningful sense. You say, well, that's what I think he's driving at. He understands they're getting persecuted. But he's saying to them, listen, if if you are, if you are sitting here and you're devoted, if you're committed, if you're devout, if you're serious, you're a zealot for the will of God, somebody who's into it. Who's going to touch you? 
They're not going to touch you, not because they can't harm you here in this world, but because given what is in store for you, the eschatological blessings that God has promised to you, none of this really matters. It fades into insignificance. Okay, in Schreiner's words, Schreiner says, Peter assured believers that nothing can ultimately harm them, ultimately. If they continue to walk in God's path, that the pain inflicted on them now is only temporary and that they will be vindicated by God on the last day. You see, I think what his thought here, Peter's thought here is very similar, I think, to what you see with with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter eight, verse thirty one, where he asked rhetorically, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? But if God is for us, who can be against us? And the understood answer is nobody can. Nobody can be against us. But again, it's nobody or no one in a qualified rather than an absolute sense. Okay, it means that given God's determination that the faithful are going to be with him forever in glory, no one can be opposed to the faithful in any way that ultimately matters. Any way that ultimately matters. You see, Who's going to be opposed? Well, there are plenty of people around who are opposed to us, but they're not opposed to us in any way that matters. Why? Because God has said, I have something so transcendent in store for you that what you're suffering here. What does Paul say? Our light and momentary troubles. They can't touch me. You can't touch me. Why? Because God has something in store. And I think that's what Peter's talking about. Just like that. Here's what Paul Actemeyer says in his commentary in the Hermeneus series. He says, The thrust of the verse is therefore not to deny the presence of social persecution in the lives of Christians, something the author knows as both possibility, see, for example, 1, 6, 3, 14, and reality, 4, 12 to 19, but rather to point out that such persecution is not capable of removing them from the the, from the divine favor shown to them in Jesus Christ. We are what if he says you're zealots for the good, you're holding on like a mad dog. What can they do to you? What are they going to do to you? You know, I just thought of that uh, story, that lady who was a uh, uh, illustration, whatever. This lady was, uh, she had a uh, drunk, abusive husband, just horrible to her. And he'd been out drinking all night, but she went to church all the time. Faithful lady. So she goes and, you know, he comes home in the morning after a bender and he's wasted and knocking her all around. He says, where are you going? She says, I'm going to church. You're not going anywhere. She says, yeah, I'm going to church. And he pulls a gun on her, points at her and says, now where are you going? She says, well, if you pull that trigger, I'm going to heaven. If you don't, I'm going to church. (laughs) You see, see this this notion of what can you do to me? You see what what ultimately what can you do to me? And we have to have something of this understanding because it fuels a willingness to suffer. You see, this is all through here and it's all through the New Testament, a willingness to suffer Because we are convinced that there is something greater in store for us that God has planned for us. And I've used this illustration of that uh, that show that I can't think of the uh, the name now, that TV show uh, where the people come. They they know the future. No, no, it it was it was a movie. uh, Terminator. All right. That's it. You had this. They had made a TV show out of that. And here you have these people who are they're the they're the only ones. They came back from the future and they know about this war of machines in the future. And so here they are living in the now with a total conviction of what the future holds. And they're just their whole life is consumed with fighting the machines. And everybody else thinks they're nuts. Why do they think they're nuts? Because they don't have their conviction of what the future holds. And so these people are living in light of the future. And that's what I'm telling you. If we have to have a conviction of what is in store, that will help us. To live for God and to uh, endure suffering in his name. Okay, so uh, back to this. All right. Peter says in in verse 16 that in in verse 16, he says that in making our defense of the faith, I got lost. It's 14. He reinforces. That's right. Verse 14 here in 14. He reinforces his assurance that the faithful cannot be harmed by men in a truly meaningful way, which is how I understood what he says here in 13. Now, who's the one that will harm you if you're zealots for the good? I've explained how I, what I think he means is that no one can ultimately harm you because what in store is in store. And then in 14, he reinforces 
that that assurance that the faithful cannot be harmed by men in a truly meaningful sense by saying that, look, even if they should suffer in persecution, suffer because of righteousness, what really matters is that they're blessed by God for the faithfulness that generates the persecution. He says, indeed, even if you should suffer because of righteousness, if you're persecuted for your faith, you're blessed. Right? You're blessed. Why? How can they touch you? Even if they persecute you, even if you suffer for righteousness, you are in fact blessed. As Jesus said in Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. OK, so this is the he wants them to understand this and see this. Now, given that men cannot really harm faithful Christians in a meaningful sense, ultimately harm them. Given that truth and given that suffering because of righteousness, being persecuted for the faith is a sign of God's blessing. Well, then Peter commands them in the second part of verse 14, not to fear the fear that their opponents bring, meaning not to fear their threats or their intimidating behavior. Given that they can't touch you, ultimately, don't fear them. Don't fear their intimidation. Don't fear their threats as they come and rail and bully and push and do all this stuff and try to shake you off the truth. Don't do it. Don't let them do that. Don't let them shake you off this. And I left this as this thing where he says in 14, so do not fear the fear of them. You can take of them, see, as a possessive, like the ball of John, meaning John's ball. Okay, so do not fear their fear, meaning the sense, do not fear the fear they bring. Do not fear their intimidation. Do not fear their threats. In fact, that's how it's translated in a number of uh, standard translations. Have no fear of them. Uh, that, that's RSV. New American, do not fear their intimidation. New King James, do not be afraid of their threats. TNIV, do not fear their threats. ESV, have no fear of them. NET, do not be terrified by them. And that's what he's talking about in light of what he's just told them, that ultimately you cannot be touched. Ultimately, when you're persecuted, you're blessed because it's a sign that your faithfulness is being reflected in the world. And that's the reason you're being persecuted for the righteousness. In light of that, you know, he he tells them, listen, don't be intimidated. We cannot be bullied from faithfulness to Christ. And that's what the culture is constantly trying to do. It's trying to get us to be ashamed of what Christ has revealed, ashamed of following him. So we have to go and go, yeah, well, you know, you're in a class. You go, well, yeah, I kind of I kind of believe that. You see, well, what is that? Do you see that that is simply pressure instead of saying, no, I, I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible is God's revelation to mankind. Dale, right. We have to obey God rather than men. No, and I, and I think it's, it's, it's a crucial thing. And I just see, you know, this is true for all societies. But I think in our society in particular, as you see this uh, revving up, I think we have to know you can't be bullied from faithfulness to God. Rather, as he commands them in verse 15, he says, instead, they are to, in their hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord, meaning they are to reaffirm in their hearts their commitment to him as Lord. He says, so do not fear the fear of them or be troubled. Don't be bullied off of this. Instead, what you're to do in your heart, you reaffirm your commitment. You sanctify him. You set him up. You set him apart. You renew your commitment to him as Lord instead of being. So here they are trying to bully you, push you, get you to compromise. You just say, no, Jesus is Lord. See, I'm reaffirming that I'm setting him apart in my heart. He's Lord, Lord of all. And I'm his servant. And what does that bring? That brings all kinds of stuff. The culture rains down on you, but we, we don't, it's not like we're the Lone Ranger. You see what they've been experiencing, what they've been facing. Now, Christians, so they're not to be bullied. And related to that, he tells them that they're always to be ready to give a defense to anyone who demands an accounting for the hope that is in or among them. Okay, they're always ready to be. So here he is when they're being trashed, they're being pressured. They're being jumped on. And he says they're always to be to be ready to give a defense to anyone who demands an accounting. See, we're to be ready to explain why we live as we do, to explain what is motivating our conduct. Why are you a disciple of Christ? We're to be able to explain that to people. You see, to explain what's motivating our conduct when the larger society is getting worked up because we're out of step with the culture. 
I don't like the way you're acting. I don't like that. You're an idiot. You know, you're, you're this and that. You're an enemy of the society. You're, you live, get your nose out of a book. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? You know, you're, you're harming everything. You're a hater. You're a bigot. You're this and that. Okay, so we need to be ready to give an, ec- an explanation, a defense of why is it we do that way? You think I woke up one day and just flipped the coin and I said, hey, I think I'll live this way? You know, you say, I, I, you know, I got nothing better to do. I think I'll just choose this. So we need to be ready to give a defense. Note that this presumes that we have solid intellectual grounds for believing the gospel is true. See, rational grounds that can be shared with others in the public arena. We are not left simply to say that we know it's true because of some private, subjective experience in our hearts. However true that is. And I wouldn't downplay that in the least. But he's talking about being able to make a defense in a public arena with some. If I just sit here and say to somebody, well, I know it's true in my heart. I have to give something that is publicly accessible. And that is why I, I, I like this kind of stuff. I did six or seven weeks on the historical case for the resurrection. That's part of why I did it. You see why? Because the case for the resurrection of Christ is powerful. Potent. Not saying, well, the Bible's inspired by God. The Bible says that. Therefore, no, no, no. We didn't do that. We came at it from the idea, ignoring the inspiration of the Bible. Let's just have a historical investigation. And I tried the best I could to lay out and see the power of the case that is there. So you say, well, why do you think? Well, let's start here. Let's start that we have this guy who's touted as a miracle worker who's coming and saying these things, he's ushered in the kingdom, and Shazam, he was raised from the dead. That's pretty powerful, you see? And so those kinds of things, I think it's important to see this. He says, look, that we need to be able to do this as people are jumping on us and, in essence, demanding an explanation and a defense for why are you living in this way when it's out of step with the culture and it's upsetting us. We say we do it because we're disciples of Jesus Christ. We're disciples of Jesus Christ because he is Lord. He is the resurrected one sent from God. God incarnate, died for our sins, rose again. And we believe that. And here's part of why we believe that. You see, and then we lay it out there for them in hopes that it'll have some impact on them. But there are never any guarantees. Okay, Shriner cautions. He says that that does not mean, of course, that every Christian is to be a highly skilled apologist for the faith. It does mean that every believer should grasp the essentials of the faith and should have the ability to explain to others why they think the Christian faith is true. You see, one of the things of postmodernism that they try to get in this idea always inconsistently, always, uh, you know, in a contradictory sense, self-refuting sense, but the idea that there is no truth. Okay, we see right away that statement, there is no truth, is an assertion of truth, so it's nuts, but they always do that. But see, you have to see what that's about. See, it's about trying to undermine this appeal. No, there is truth. There is truth. And this is the truth. And that's we submit to this truth. We we come to see that is true. And we bow before the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Peter says in verse 16 that in making our defense of the faith, we're to do so with gentleness and fear, having a clear conscience. We are to exercise gentleness toward our challengers, which sometimes is uh A challenge in itself. You see, as people are, but this is part of how we treat those who oppose us. So gentleness toward our challengers and respond with fear of the God who commands that gentleness, fear in the sense that we've talked about, keeping our consciences clear through our faithfulness to him and in all all aspects of our life. And one purpose of our being that we have to be ready to give a defense of why we live as we do is so that those who demand that defense through their attacking of us, when they're saying, you know, that's stupid, that's stupid, there's no basis for that, you shouldn't be living that way, you're just living in the past, that's been shown by intellectuals not to be true, you're just, oh, you're just in the dark ages, I come through with you. When somebody is doing that, they are demanding that we explain and provide a basis for why we believe as we do. You see, so we, in doing this, and part of the reason he calls us to do that is so that those who are demanding that explanation through attacking us for living as Christians, so that they may be put to shame by having their hostility exposed as the ignorance that it is. 
in the hopes that perhaps others and maybe even they might come to come to believe as we do. You see that they're they're just sitting here all, you know, just so blustery and, you know, I have a Ph.D. and I know that we came from nowhere out of nothing by chance and you're an idiot. OK, and we're saying, uh, no, slow, just slow. That's uh, there was something out here today. I won't. Uh, last week where Stephen Hawking's got some new book coming out and just saying things that, uh, you know, that uh, we just come out of nowhere. You see, we have these fluctuations of nothing and you're going, well, you know, we have we have laws of gravity hanging around there. Stephen, uh, is that nothing? Uh, anyway, uh, we'll talk about that some other time. I've spent, I think, maybe a year I did on creation stuff and I'm I'm. Uh, I'm wanting to do that again, but we're going to do Second Peter next. But I, I like that kind of stuff, and I think it's important. Okay, so he, so he says, look, part of the reason is that so they, they can come and see our purposes, that they can you know be put to shame for having done this. So when you're attacking somebody and it's exposed that listen, all of this this bluster of yours and this hostility and this anger directed, what this person's saying is perfectly reasonable and defensible. Well, then you're put to shame for having jumped on somebody in ignorance. That's what I think. There are other ways of looking at that, but that's what I think he's doing. Now, in verse 17, he reinforces the call to keep their conduct good, to live with a clear conscience before God. And they are to do so, he says, for it is better to suffer for doing good, to suffer persecution for behavior in accordance with the Christian faith, which suffering God sometimes permits, if, if the will of God wills. It's better to suffer that way than to suffer punishment for wrongdoing. You see, so by by living righteously, by living in accordance with the will of God, they ensure that whatever suffering they receive from their opponents is persecution. It's suffering for Christ rather than justified punishment. He's already said, look, there's, there's no benefit if you're a wrongdoer and you receive punishment. You're just getting what you deserve. But if you do good, then when they're jumping on you, it's not because of a wrong you did. It's persecution. They're jumping on you because of the reflection of your life is reflecting Jesus Christ. And remember, Jesus said, you know, if they hate me, they hate me, they're going to hate you. Uh, you have to know that. You see, there is an irrational thing in this, this whole world. There's a spiritual war going on. And people who aren't tuned into that, they just think, no, no, this is just people. That are. <laughs> Look, there's a war going on. All right. And we're, we're at the center of it. Now, let me say just a note here. Oh, the bell's going to ring. We're going to look at 18 to 22 and, and following in two weeks, Lord willing. But I've got to say something about 18 to 22, so hang with me if the bell rings. Just give me a second here. Uh, I want to alert you to the difficulty of this section. I want to do that just so you know that, that we have to tread here with an extra degree of humility and circumspection. Uh, all right, because uh, there's just difficult stuff in there. I'm going to do my best, tell you how I see, how I see it, what I think he's saying. But I'm quite mindful that you can see it different ways, okay? It's not like I'm not tuned into that. But let me read you just a couple of things. Just give me a second here. Actemeyer, he says in verses 18 to 22, he says, there's little question that these verses constitute the most difficult passage in the entire letter. John Eliot in his commentary says, the passage poses a staggering number of difficult questions. Karen Jobes in her commentary says, the passage in 1 Peter is the one most debated and written about. From the earliest days of the church, it's been understood in different ways. Indeed, Martin Luther, you know, the Reformation leader, Martin Luther said, this is a strange text and certainly a more obscure passage than any other in the New Testament. I still do not know for sure what the apostle meant. OK, the literature on this text is absolutely enormous because it's difficult to understand. OK, so I'm going to present to you in two weeks, Lord willing, how I understand it. Mindful of the fact there are different takes on it. But what do I do? I study it and I tell you how I see it, tell you why I see it that way, offer it to you, you weigh it, do with it what you will. Okay? Thanks for coming.